I'm going to talk about inference for modern epigenetics. So we, we've seen work, several iterations of models, where whether for genetics or for ecology or various other things. And common to all of them, I dare say, is that there are parameters that you need to fit if you want to use these models to really explain or explore real data sets. Uh, if, 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 you, if, if anyone comes to me and says they absolutely know all the parameters in all of their models, well, they're probably a theoretical physicist, and the only reason they know those parameters is because somebody's already done this sort of work on that model before to figure them out. So, um, you know, in order to take take advantage of modeling and any applied analysis, you need some sort of way of doing modeling. So that, that's what I want to focus on. Um, in particular, I'm going to focus on sort of computationally intensive simulation-based methods for two reasons, really. One is they tend to be pretty prevalent and are among the only things you can kind of reliably do for a relatively broad range of complicated models. Um, it is rare, I think, for a modern model which, which really captures the detail of what's going on in a, in a domain like the life sciences to be able to write down nice Galkin approximations or other things which you can handle analytically without introducing biases or errors which are difficult to quantify. And the second reason is that the computational stuff just happens to be what they know about. So that, that biases the talk itself. Um, <clears throat> brief lecture, of, brief overview of the three lectures I'm going to give. So this is the first one. I'm going to be talking about Monte Carlo methods for the coalescence. So I'll, I'll briefly recap the coalescent model and the right Fisher diffusion. That'll probably be rather tedious for those of you in the room, but hopefully it'll be over quickly. And then I will introduce several categories, several kinds of different Monte Carlo models, which you might try to resort to if you have to fit a model along these lines yourself. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to add recombination into the picture, and essentially everything in lecture one goes out the window by virtue of being now computationally totally infeasible. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll give you some alternatives for what you might be able to do instead. And then lecture three is this opposite direction of time. So like analysis talk, I'm going to have models come in pairs. One describes the forward evolution of allele frequencies in the population. One describes the backward genealogies of samples arising from those models. The first two talks are going to be backward in time. Here I'm going to be talking about what sort of inference you can do forward in time. And there we have to tackle how you do inference with objects which are diffusion trajectories, which are a priori infinite dimensional. And computers can do lots of things, but they cannot store infinite dimensional objects. So you have to do something a bit cleverer than that. All right, <clears throat> so here's a more detailed outline on lecture one in particular. So yeah, this, I wasn't aware of Alice's exact plans for her talk before I wrote these slides. This, there, there will be some substantial overlap here. Um, but having introduced the coalescent and briefly sketched the right pressure diffusion in anticipation of my Friday talk, I will then talk about three kinds of um, Monte Carlo algorithms for the coalescent model. So the first, Markov chain Monte Carlo, for those of you who sort of already know a little bit about the terminology, will in particular be focusing on the metropolis hastings algorithm. Then there's approaches based on importance sampling. And thirdly, something called approximate basic computation. And a lot of this will be relatively historical. Much of this development happened in the 90s, early 2000s. And um, it was really, there's a kind of intimate interlinking between the needs of increasingly complicated data sets and population genetics on the one hand, and development of methodology and computational statistics on the other, where the computational statistics people were kind of put, pushed by the biologists to, to build their models in order to be able to handle genetic data sets. And actually, quite often it happened that the biologists wrote down some sort of algorithm which they liked using for their model in the first instance, and then later on, statisticians came around and noticed actually there's a generic algorithm in here, and it does something better than we've been able to, to do previously. So since the sort of 90s onwards, the, the biologists have largely, played, largely played, played the role that physicists used to play, which is that they used to discover everything first in some ad hoc fashion, and then the mathematicians came along later and noticed that Actually, this is really useful, and if we only make it rigorous, then then we get interesting results out of it as well. So the same thing is happened with well, with genetics and with computational statistics. So, without further ado, the right fish model. We have a finite population. I don't. It, 
five seems to be the population size that fits on a slide. The only difference <laughs> dollars in the slides is that my generations are going horizontally and my population size is very supposed to vice versa. Time is going forward. I've also got two alleles and the individuals are picking parents uniformly at random. Um, I've arranged my right vision model to be a bit more plain than it was before, but that's purely for, for visual purposes. It's not supposed to be any structure or anything either. So everyone's picking parents uniformly at random. You see coalescence events. I've also got mutation events happening in here. Um, but yeah, this is the exact same right vision model that Alison was talking about in her talk. And I'm going to take exactly the same sorts of scalings and obtain the, um, the right picture diffusion. So I have a population size, I have a per replication probability of experiencing mutation events. The only difference in notation is that I've decorated by my mu with a capital N to emphasize the fact that it has to scale with the population size. And if I look at the fraction of a particular allele in generation N, it's binomial. It's got the same sort of success probability as it did previously. And if I take the same sort of rescaling where I rescale time by the population size and look at the, the fraction of individuals rather than the frequency of individuals and rescale my mutation in the right sort of way, then I get a limiting statistic process, which is this diffusion. Um, the contribution of the mutation term has gone into this drift coefficient. The contribution of the drift has gone into the diffusion coefficient, unless it already highlighted this unfortunate clash in terminology. I'm not going to make any effort to resolve it. Um, and yeah, for further, further details on this model, I defer you to the experts. I was rude about Alison's notes on stochastic finance earlier over the coffee break, so I hope I make up for that by paying homage to the ones instead. I get royalties on the finance notes. <laughs> Read the finance notes. <laughs> I'm sure they're very nice. <laughs> All right. And along the same lines as Alison spoke again, there is a second model contained in this same diagram, which will be the kingdom coalescent. It is obtained by looking at a sample of individuals, say a pair, this one, this one, and reasoning about what happens backward in time, supposing I don't yet know anything about their colours. So I forget I've observed the, the black and white filling of circles. Then, well, each of them chooses a parent uniformly at random from the previous generation. What's the probability they pick the same parent? Well, one individual has to pick a particular individual, that's one over capital N. Second individual has to pick exactly the same individual, capital N again, so I'm one over capital N squared. I have N choices of individual, so one power cancels out, I'm left with one over N. And I use that time scaling, I obtain a coalescent model. Coalescent tree, where if I, so I, I rescale geometric one over N, squeeze n generations into one unit at a time, well that begins to look a lot like exponential one, so each pair of individuals ought to, ought to be coalescing the grade one, and hence when I have k lineages, I coalesce with, with rate k choose two. Upon a coalescence event, I pick a random pair of individuals, they will coalesce together like so, and then I carry on until I reach the most recent common system. Um, this is initially formulated in these terms by in the 1980s. And one of the nice aspects of this backwards in time model in particular is that it's very pleasant to put in and to, to connect this model of ancestry to, to a model of genetic diversity. So I can incorporate mutations along the branches. Um, I'm thinking here of the infinite sites model of mutation in particular, but for the purposes of my talk, it doesn't particularly matter that that's what I'm working with. Um, you can make all the same things work for finite sites, finite alleles model with an increase in computational cost, but conceptually everything follows through. But uh, I'm going to be thinking well, for the most part of the infinite sites model. So mutations happen along branches, in particular the horizontal parts of branches, the vertical ones don't really have any meaning in this diagram. The number of mutations along a branch is plus on with parameter given by the length of the branch times this mutation rate that arises out of the coalescent model and each mutation is endowed with a location, which we think of as a location along a chromosome with infinitely many lineages. So the things over here on the, on the right-hand edge are sampled chromosomes from a population. 
um, they carry these mutations. So for instance, these first two chromosomes over here, they have this mutation and this mutation in common. So those two had better be these two over here on this branch. This mutation must be that one. This one's that one. That one's over here. And yeah, mutations are inherited along branches onto the chromosomes, which their branch tends. And well, this is a generative algorithm now, a, a, a random algorithm for generating a realization of genetic diversity from a hypothetical population. Uh, this picture I have on the, the right rather resembles the uh, Thousand Genomes Project mutation data sets that was up on Alice's slides. So that's precisely the point I want to imagine. Well, if I had a real data set, I can imagine that it was generated by this process. And then I can start reasoning about what must the mutation rate be, for instance, in order for my the, the 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 predicted pattern of diversity over here to coincide as closely as possible with the one that I've observed, and typically um, this is the sort of setting that biological data sets arise out of. I think a fair few people in the audience have probably seen this slide more times than they would have liked already, but I'll talk through it one more time nevertheless. Um, so here's what a biologist will give you. It's the, the sequences they've observed from their organisms, which are roughly contemporaneously sampled. So they all come more or less from the same time point, at least from the time scale of genetic evolution. And what they don't have is this tree that generated the data or the mutations annotated on top of that tree. And well, given this data set, you have a likelihood function. So a likelihood just expresses the probability of the data sets given some underlying parameter thinking here of the mutation rate, but if I had a more richly parameterized model with variable population sizes or natural selection and so on, then this could be a vector valued bigger parameter, which describe more processes, but uh, we'll, we'll stick with the mutation rate for now. And the likelihood principle in statistics essentially states it's unlikely that unlikely things have happened. And how that translates to science is you should be prepared to believe in parameters which give higher probability for the event that you in fact observed. You can get into rabbit holes about philosophy on giving precise meanings and that sort of statement, but for, for the purposes of this talk, the, the details don't really matter very much. Just that um, you want to believe in putative explanations of nature, theta, which give relatively large value to this probability, such that they make the observation that you saw typical. Is it unlikely you saw something atypical? Unfortunately, we don't have access to this for coalescent models or really any models in biology. Um, the only exception is things which break one of the axioms that Alison brought up in the um, in this kind of synthesis of uh, of Darwin's and Mendel's theories, which is if you make um, the alleles of offspring more or less independent of the alleles of their parents, then you can make progress here. Right? At this level, on the, on the left hand side, this is the parent independent mutation model, so where, where the allele of a mutant child is independent of the allele of its parent. That doesn't describe any system in biology. Right? So, yeah, it, it, it gives rise to some very, very beautiful mathematical theories, the UN sampling formula, and so on, which are terms that many people may have heard about. but the connections in biology is tentative at best. Instead, we have to look at this guy here, or something resembling it, which, let me unpick the notation a little bit. So A here is supposed to be an ancestry, that's the ancestral tree. So what I'm doing here is so-called data augmentation, which is if there's something that I don't know, but I wish that I did know, such that I can evaluate likely to function, let me pretend I know it, condition on it, and then all I have to do is remember to integrate it out afterwards. And so here I I've conditioned on the ancestral tree, and this is the probability of the ancestral tree given parameters, and then I'm integrating over all possible ancestries. Now, the set of all possible ancestral trees for a given data set is this large high dimensional combinatorial object. So you won't be surprised to hear that this integral cannot be evaluated analytically in any, um, in any setting of practical interest. Instead, you're forced to resort to some sort of numerical methods and even then, more or less the only thing that has a hope of working for any samples larger than, say, about 50 sequences, you're looking at some kind of Monte Carlo method, doing some kind of simulation 
sampling of trees and using an empirical ensemble of pseudo-random trees to approximate the value of it. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and the remainder of today's talk, I'm going to talk about three different ways to, to do that sampling. Um, I'll formulate these algorithms in two ways. Firstly, as generic sampling algorithms for a general model of interest. And then secondly, try to specialize them to what have people done for coalesced models specifically. So hopefully, even if you're not interested in coalesced models directly, um, you, you may still get something out of this if there's a model that, if there's a different model you want to fit at some point. So, Metropolis Hastings is probably the, the, the single most famous algorithm along the flavor of what I've been talking about. And in order to approximate the value of an integral, like this one on the previous slide, what it says is it constructs a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is this integrand of interest. <laughs> then it runs that chain for a long, long time and treats the sort of empirical um, path trajectory coming out of that chain as approximately ID draws and uses a kind of large numbers type situation to, to turn that into an approximation of this the value of this integral. Here's how the chain progresses. Uh, you can forget about trees for the purpose of this slide. This is just a completely abstract state space, but I want to sample from some target distribution, which I'm denoting by pi, and x is my variable for in of interest. I start from a pretty arbitrary initial condition. Plug in any old value of my state that I like, and then I need to write the following dynamic. I have some proposal kernel which perturbs my current state. So typically this is something in, in RD value settings, this is something like a Gaussian random walk, something along those lines. Uh, and then all the action really happens in this step, which decides whether I retain my proposed perturbation or my current state of the algorithm as the next state of the chain. And in order to get an idea of what's going on here, it's instructed to imagine that Q with a symmetric proposal kernel in which it cancels out here and just look at the ratio of pi's. So Y is my perturbed state, my new state that I'm trying to go into. And if my target distribution, which I'm implicitly assuming here has a density with respect to something nice like a Lebesgue measure. So if my target density has a, has a higher value in the new perturbed state than in my current state, then I move up. So if, if I propose to go uphill, then I always accept. And this pushes me towards modes of my target distribution. But I don't, it, it could be that my distribution is multimodal. I don't want to get stuck in a mode. So if my Y has lower target probability, then I still accept with a probability which is less than one. So I'm less inclined to go downwards. But I'll still do it on occasion just to make sure I don't get stuck. I'm able to explore the same space. And this has been chosen precisely to ensure that pi is, a, is an invariant distribution of this chain. In fact, this induces um, reversibility with respect to pi, so the chain satisfies detail balance with respect to pi, and so pi is, a, is an invariant distribution. Under further nice conditions, you can ensure things like it being the unique stationary distribution, and you can get bounds on convergence. Um, there's a particularly nice coupling argument by Jeff Rosenthal, which lets you get these sorts of things, but I think I'm probably slightly pressed for time to give you a sketch of what it is, but you can ask me about it if you'd like. Um, okay, so in terms of the formulation of this algorithm, the design of Q in theory doesn't matter very much, as long as it's not completely pathological, so it rules out regions of the state space or something like that, then you get the correct stationary distribution. But from a practical point of view, the design of Q matters very much. Um, it determines the efficiency of the algorithm. And so it's worth, in practice, spending time thinking about, well, what sort of Q should you choose in practice? Um, there are very nice theoretical results telling you what you should do in RD value settings when your target distribution is a product of independent marginals and similar sort of toy settings. And they're surprisingly robust in many cases, but they certainly don't resemble tree value settings at all. So it's fair to say, I think, that for coalescent type algorithms, 
there's not really any guidance whatsoever. There's virtually nothing that can be said about what an ideal queue should look like. So you mentioned pi here needs to be taken in the fusion. Then if we can treat in a tree table, what would be the taken distribution? Right. So it would be the conditional distribution of the coalescent tree given the ancestral sequences at the end. So if you imagine the Kingman coalescent distribution multiplied by the indicator function that the leaves carry exactly this configuration of mutations renormalized so it integrates the one again. That's the, the distribution you'd like to sample from. Um, yeah, so I can't tell you anything about what an optimal uh, proposal distribution would be for a coalescent. It's, I can tell you about what sorts of things people have tried. So that's what I'll do for, for the next little while. Here are two examples of the sorts of dynamics that people use. I'll go through each of them in a, in a brief sketch. Um, the first being nearest neighbor interchanges. So what does a nearest neighbor interchange look like? First of all, I choose a random branch along my tree. Um, I can choose it uniformly at random. I can choose it somehow proportional to branch length. There are design choices to be made there. Um, but let's say I've chosen this one. And it's adjacent to four branches along this tree, which I've colored in here. So here's one adjacent branch, one other one, and two others here. And I want to essentially pivot the pattern of these branches. So if you, everything is done with respect to this focal branch. So these two are sort of on one side of that branch, and these two are on another side. And I want to shuffle that relationship. So I think on the next slide, you'll see that if memory serves, the green and the purple branch are going to change places. Yeah, that was right. So the green branch has jumped over here, taking its mutation with it. These two have also flipped, but the horizontal position, the vertical position rather of these lineages doesn't have any meaning in the first place, so that's okay. And I've changed the tree. It's a, it's a, it's a different tree by any reasonable definition of what difference means for trees. And so this would now constitute a new proposed perturbed tree as the state of my algorithm to which I could apply an accept or reject mechanism. Um, I haven't changed the tree very much. For instance, I haven't changed any of the branch lengths at all. All the, all the coalescence times are in the same position. So I would probably want to also design other types of kernels, which will, for instance, move this coalescence point upwards and downwards and um, I would also want further transitions, which we have these static parameters, this mutation rate, for instance, hanging around. So I would want to change the value of the mutation rate parameter. Um, but after each of those kinds of steps, I would apply my accept reject mechanism. And that guarantees that I retain the correct sort of stationarity for my chain. And you can, it's not immediately obvious, but it's hopefully not too difficult to believe that if I iterate the right number of these kinds of Nearest neighbor, tree, nearest neighbor interchange dynamics, I can go from any tree to any other tree, uh, which means I'm not excluding any part of my state space or anything along those lines, and I have my desired target stationary distribution on the space of trees. The next um, kind of motion is perhaps conceptually even simpler, which is the subtree prune regraft step. I pick a pair of branches. And I pick one of them to detach from the rest of the tree, and I want to try and reattach it into the middle of the other one. Do this. Um, <clears throat> and again, this creates what is a different tree in the end. So this would be the result. And I can play the same game. Um, I either accept or reject this sort of proposal, um, depending on what is the, the kind of value of my target distribution at this new tree versus the old one that I started with, and I make my decision and I iterate the dynamics, and again, they're able to explore the state of all possible binary trees. Um, in terms of these two competing kind of kern perturbation kernels, which one you ought to prefer, well, in a sense, the nearest neighbor interchange one is the more local of the two. On, on the slides that I've presented thus far, it probably looks bigger because it involves more branches. 
But the point is that this nearest neighbor interchange only makes a really small kind of local perturbation to this connected region of branches over here. So you can imagine this was a small subtree of a much larger tree that extended upstairs. Um, <clears throat> then it would still only change these four and nothing would move a big graph distance within the tree. Uh, or all of the, the new reattachment points would be a small graph distance away from where they started from, so on and so forth. Whereas this thing, well, unless I sort of constrain my choice of these pairs somehow, which is itself a complicated thing to do, um, then I can make essentially arbitrarily big jumps in terms of the, the graph distance along the tree between where my previous reattachment point was and where the new one is going to be. So arguably, this one tends to result in less local moves, which are advantageous because if they are accepted, then they improve the mixing of your chain and the ability of your chain to mix over in state space is crucial. But they are disadvantageous in that they're typically unlikely to be accepted. And so there's a balance to be struck between the two. You want to have both some small local moves and probably some bigger, more adventurous moves. And again, for Colas models, this appraise no theoretical guidance I can offer on what the right ratio should be. This is just a, a case of trial and error, really. Okay. <clears throat> this is what output from a chain like this might look like. Um, this is a, a, a data set that I, I ran a chain on um, a while back. Uh, it has, I think the sample size is 55. There are about 18. Um, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, these mutations within the data set. So by any stretch of the imagination nowadays, this is a very small data set. The chain ran in about a minute. Um, and you can sort of see that it identifies reasonable values. Well, I mean, who, who says whether these are reasonable or not, but it identifies a nice peak distribution of possible values of our mutation rates. This is a population rescale mutation rate for the model, of course. And likewise, you can sort of do things like query the, the tree heights that arise out of your, your model um, over here. Under a kingdom coalescence, we would expect the expect that the mean tree height to be about two. So it looks like this particular data set probably arose from a tree that was somewhat shorter. The posterior distribution is more closely peaked at one than at two. Um, these are the kind of trace plots of the whole chain runs. So this is a million steps that the, the MCMC algorithm took. Um, and the reason I put these up is to show you what sort of a well mixing chain looks like. So this is a, this looks like a homogeneous blob across the entire support of the chain. And that's what you want a well mixing algorithm to look like. If you were, were able to see sort of visible autocorrelation where the chain was visibly drifting upwards and downwards, that would not be mixing particularly well. You should not trust the output of that chain if you run it longer until it looks like this sort of homogeneous blob. And lastly, this is the, the same two variables on a 2D scatter plot where you can see that there's a pretty clear correlation between the two. Um, one looks like the reciprocal of the other a little bit up to some, some noise, which is perhaps to be expected because the, the mutation distribution was determined by the product of the mutation rate and the branch lengths. If you say a tree height as a scalar proxy of typical branch lengths, then you, you would expect these things to be universally correlated. And if I were to try to use this insight to design a cleverer chain, then probably I would like to try to update these two things jointly in such a way to roughly preserve the inverse relationship that would make it so that my chain is more easily able to accept proposals which traverse a bigger gap over here. In my chain, I was updating the tree in one step and the mutation rate in another step. And so that sort of forces steps to go horizontally or vertically rather than in this sort of diagonal fashion where I'm probably able to take bigger steps, mix more quickly. So that's it for MCMC. There are a bunch of different moves that people have proposed, um, of which my two rather naive examples are in here somewhere, but there are many, many other mechanisms. None of them have any more theoretical support than what I've shown you or what I've already told you, but um, they all seem to work very well for the examples with which they have been published. There are also reasons for skepticism. Um, MCMC algorithms in some limited settings where 
analytical calculations are possible are known to scale very badly. Um, if you make either the number of leaves bigger or make the sort of complexity of the data set larger, for instance, by taking more SNPs in your data set, um, your algorithm will not scale well. You could not run this on a thousand genomes data set, for instance, even if a combination. Um, and likewise, there have been some sort of refinements that people have proposed which try to take advantage of gradients of a target density. Okay, there's some um, care needs to be taken in what even a gradient means because the tree topology is ostensibly a discrete object, so defining a gradient with respect to it takes some care, but it can be done, and there are instances where it has been done, and the sort of resulting gradient information lets you put momentum into your chain, so it'll tend to go in one direction for as long as there's support in your target density that that's a good direction to go into and then switch once it sees that it's going downhill. Um, none of that. It, it results in speed up, but none of it's a game. None of it's a game changer. It doesn't make a qualitative difference to the fact that this, this doesn't scale brilliantly. Okay, that was it for MCMC. I promised three algorithms. I have twenty five minutes remaining and two algorithms to cover. Um, but the third one's pretty simple, so hopefully we'll be all right. Uh, the second one is importance. Again, this is a completely generic way in which to try to approximate that integral that we want to approximate with, in, the, in that data augmentation slide that I started with. And we can shortly specialize into what sort of things you should do for trees. But suppose for now that I just want to approximate an integral with respect to a target distribution. It's changed to a P from a pi for no particular reason, but hopefully that's not, um, not too uh, insurmountable. So I want to approximate this for some test function F and my x is a p-distributed random variable. What's a simple thing I can do? Well, if I can simulate from a variable p, I can sample iid realizations, x1 to xn, and use this naive Monte Carlo estimator, which is just the ensemble average of functions evaluated on the realizations of my simulation. This, uh, there's plenty of theoretical guarantees that this is a nice thing to do. It has the correct expected value if f has finite p variance, then you can prove central limit theorems and so on and so forth. Where this gets difficult is if f is a function which takes large values in a region of small p probability, then what's going to happen is I'm simulating my idea from p, but almost all of those realizations are going to give me negligible outcomes in my estimator. And I'm going to have to wait a very long time until I see an X, which actually gives me the kind of interesting region, interesting contribution to F. And so what I would be better off doing is simulate from a different distribution, Q, which I need to specify, and changing my objective function from F to be this ratio P upon Q times F. And of course, this ratio over here means that if I write down this integral explicitly as an integral of this test function, qx dx, then the q's cancel, and I'm left with just the same expected value of f over p, so I still have the right mean, but if I choose my q well, I can dramatically reduce the variance. On the other hand, there are also examples where if you choose q badly, you can dramatically inflate the variance. So this is it's going to be a common flavor to this talk that none of these methods you can apply completely naively. You need to be careful and check things are actually working, but if you do, there are gains to be made. But in any case, um, so how do you design these sorts of algorithms for coalescent problems? Let me give you two equivalent constructions of the discrete jump skeleton of the Kingman coalescent. Um, King McCullough's decorated with infinite size mutations in particular. So the first one is probably the more conventional one, where I start at the leaves, I have some fixed sample sized number of n leaves, and I want to, gener I want to generate a coalescent from them. So I iterate the following dynamics while I have more than one lineage remaining. With this probability, I merge two uniformly chosen lineages. This is just the competing exponential rate 
of a merger versus a mutation while there are k lineages. And with the complementary probability, I add a mutation to one of my lineages. And then I keep going back until I reach the most recent common ancestor. And that generates the realization of the hemocolysis of mutation. I also have a forward in time branching construction, which I can make, where I initialize two lineages. And while I have less than n, or less than or equal to n, I split a lineage with this probability, and I now increment my lineage count by one. And with the complementary probability, I again add mutation to a lineage. And if you sort of draw a picture of a coalescent tree and write down the corresponding rate, the sort of exponential lengths of inter-arrival holding times, you'll see that these two constructions give you exactly the same distribution. And the reason I bring it up is because this one will be more convenient to formulate this important sampling proposal distribution for. So here is the analog of, a, of the kind of naive Monte Carlo estimate before any important sampling. I have an observed configuration in a muta of mutations in a sample of size n. Um, and I repeat the following dynamics. I simulate a coalescent tree with mutations until it hits n plus 1 lineages and drop the final split. So this, I, if, I, if I ended my simulation exactly when the n lineages hit, then I would guarantee, for instance, that with probability 1, I always have two lineages which are identical in type because there wouldn't be any any time for, for mutations to accrue between the last lineage and the, the kind of time of the leaves. So this turns out to be uh, just going one further than your sample size and dropping, simulating any mutations along that last holding time and then dropping the final branching event turns out to be the right thing to do. And if as a result of this forwarding construction, I happen to get a realization where my simulated mutations exactly match my observed mutations, then I increment a counter. And I return this estimator, which is the number of times that my, my mutations matched, divided by the number of simulations I tried. Um, it's a valid algorithm, but it's a hopeless algorithm. Because for any reasonable sample size, even, even unreasonably small sample size, say, say 10 leaves, the probability of precisely matching a configuration of mutations from this simulation to a, a a realization in a data set is essentially zero. You will be running this simulation for the rest of your life and probably the rest of the life of the planet. And you won't see many instances in which you um, hit exactly the right configuration. In an infinite sites model, there's even a density involved in the location of each mutation. So it could be that the, the probability of actually matching exactly is equal to zero, in which case you're evaluating a probability density rather than the probability of an event. Um, but you still want to sort of be able to make progress. This is, there's still a, a well-defined inference problem to do, and so you need a cleverer algorithm in order to be able to cope with that situation. Um, and so what do we do? Well, this is a, a somewhat dense slide, but it summarizes conceptually how you construct this proposal distribution Q in order to overcome this problem. And what we will want to do is we will want to formulate Q as the time reversal of this branching construction of the coalescent tree. So I started off introducing the coalescent as a backward in time process. Then I gave a forward in time branching construction of that. Now I want to again reverse the time of that forward in time branching construction to go backwards in time, but this time with mutation already decorated on the leaves. That's the crucial difference. Um, the backward in time rates of coalescence and mutation, given a, muta a configuration of mutation at the leaves, are intractable. I don't have access to those. If I did, I could use them to write down an optimal algorithm that returned exactly the right likelihood every time and would have zero variance. It's a identifying those back, the, the, the true conditional backward rates given sequence of observed mutations is equivalent to solving the whole problem I'm trying to solve to begin with, so that's hopeless. But um, I can identify some sort of approximation, and the, these importance weights, the ratios of these cues will still ensure that I have a correct algorithm at the end. So this, this cartoon is sort of 
depicting what's going on in my simulation. These P steps were the branching construction forward in time. So I sort of started from H1, which is the historical configuration at the root of the trees. This is when I have just two sequences, which have just branched from the most recent common ancestor. And then I propose a P step, which uh, is the conditional distribution of the next state in the jump skeleton branching forward in time from the roots leafwards. And this is the trajectory the algorithm follows. And then I checked, well, did I happen to spit out a configuration at the leaves, which matches my observed data set P? And typically, I don't. Backward in time, I choose as my initialization a distribution which is just a delta mass at the observed configuration. So I can always start my chain from the exact observed leaves. That's the big advantage of the reverse approach. And then all I have to do is design these reverse time dynamics, Q, in such a way that they, they propose mutation events and coalescence events conditional on the observed, on the, on the mutations within the, these configurations H until they reach the root. And well, then I'm done. I just form this ratio of all of the Qs and all of the Ps in this sort of product form that I have here on the slide. And this is exactly the same sort of iteration of important sampling that I had on the previous slide, where it was just one P by, by one Q. It's just that my distributions are now defined on a more complicated sort of stochastic process like state space rather than just single variables. But that's the only difference. Um, I've dropped my indicator function over here. So on the previous slide, I had this function f, which was the indicator that h is equal to d. I've dropped that here, but that's because it's always one by construction. Okay, so this is able to, well, this is ostensibly able to reduce variance massively if you choose to well. How do you choose Q? Well, this is a, a question which was answered by Stephen and Donnelly in the year 2000. Um, for the Kingman coalescent, the following choice of Q is optimal. Um, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time unpicking these expressions, except to sort of notice that the first line corresponds to proposing a mutation event backward in time. The second, second line corresponds to proposing a coalescence event backward in time. And you can sort of see there's a mutation rate where you might expect there to be a mutation rate. Um, this size of H is the number of lineages remaining. So this is very reminiscent to theta over K minus one plus theta in the, in the construction of these branching jump skeletons of the given coalescence. Likewise, over here, I have um, the number of lineages of a given type, again, divided by the same sort of normalizing factor. The exciting bit is these pies here, which are now conditional. So I have here, the con for instance, the conditional probability of sampling a lineage of type beta, given that I've already observed this configuration. So hj plus one is my sort of generic state of the chain at present when I'm proposing the next step backward in time. So I remove one lineage from it and think what's the probability of observing a beta from it as opposed to observing an alpha from it. And this sort of ratio will govern the rate with which I want to propose mutations back at the time. And likewise over here, we have this sort of conditional sampling distribution in the denominator only. Um, <clears throat> so I said that this is the optimal proposal distribution. Um, if I were able to implement this, then I would again be in the regime where I can write down a zero variance estimator that gives me my exact likelihood with just one realization. And so it's pretty obvious that this, this expression must be impractical. And indeed it is. These, uh, these conditional sampling distributions have no known closed form formula for any model beyond these parent independent mutation models. Um, but the scale of quantities, right? We've sort of gone from thinking about a whole configuration at once to thinking of sampling just one extra lineage given a type. So maybe that's something that we can reason about. We can come up with some qualitative approximation to these sorts of formulas, and then we can use those as proposal distributions in an important sampling algorithm and let the importance weights correct for the fact that I'm not using the optimal algorithm.
And that, well, so um, the, 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 the first instances of, the, of approximate conditional sampling distributions were already written down by Stevens and Donnelly in that same paper I cited on the previous slide, but a uh, kind of more generically understandable way in which to think about them was proposed by Paul and Song some later. Um, there are also many other papers which have made contributions to these conditional sampling distribution families that sort of took on a life of their own and became their own model and their own object of interest, which I'll go into in more detail in the next talk. Um, but for the time being, I just want to give you Paul and Song's heuristic for how to construct a conditional sampling distribution. So I want to think about what's the this what's the distribution of a fifth lineage given an observed configuration of four lineages. And if I wanted to if I was conditioning on all of this tree as well as these four lineages, then this would be relatively easy. I would just merge my lineage somewhere into the tree and run the mutation process along it and obtain a realization of sort of the, the heuristic sketch of how that would go. But of course, the problem is that I don't have this tree. That's the bit of the realization I haven't yet simulated because I'm constructing my thing back to the time. And what Paul and Sol proposed was, well, let's make life easy and just pretend that nothing happens to these four lineages that I've already got. This sort of makes it so that I propose some sort of merger time for my new lineage into one of these four lineages. At that point, I don't have to worry about the fact that these, these four lineages are never merged with each other. They've already got fixed types. All I have to do is generate a type for this guy. So then I'll independently run the mutation process along that branch and hence generate what the diversity is over here. In the infinite size picture, I have to be a little bit more careful because I also have to be able to remove mutations from these guys. So I want to run a mutation back along this branch and then forward again, but sort of modular details like that. that. That's the sketch of how one writes down a generative model from this conditional sampling, sampling distribution pie. And it's a generative model, which is simple enough that you can actually write down analytical expressions for what the kind of corresponding density evaluates to and so you get an implementable algorithm. Okay, um, that concludes the, the, the important sampling algorithm for now. Um, it also doesn't scale particularly well. If anything, it, it's probably more difficult to make it scale well than Metropolis Hastings in most cases. And for both of those algorithms, you, you, uh, you can hope to get to hundreds of individuals. You can hope to do sort of hundreds of thousands of kilobases, hundreds of thousands of bases, hundreds of kilobases, something like that for human life parameters, but you will struggle to get algorithms which go far beyond that, let's say. Um, <clears throat> the third algorithm I want to talk about very briefly um, is really the only one which does a little bit better in terms of scaling already, and the only one which will make a reappearance, a, a substantial reappearance tomorrow when we talk about recombination, and that's approximate Bayesian computation. And the gain in computational scalability comes at a cost, which is that this will no longer sample exactly from that, that same sort of integral that I had at the beginning. It will be a, a sketch of the integral, which looks sort of similar if you squint, but there will be a bias fault, which is in general difficult to quantify. So how does the simplest approximate Bayesian computational algorithm go? Um, incidentally, I should say, I've cited here Beaumont, Sang, and Balding, which is the really the first appearance of ABC in, in its recognizable modern formulation, but really this is an example of one of those things, going back to Simon Tavare in 1997, where he really proposed this as just a computational trick for the coalescent. And then it was realized, hang on, he's onto something here. It became a generic statistical algorithm, and this is used all over the place in large weather models, in <laughs> epidemics, in, in very big, important models these days. Um, anyway, I'm given an observed realization from some model B given some true underlying parameter of theta star. I don't know what theta star is, but I'm assuming it exists. And I have some prior distribution for the value of theta star. Then I can, iterate the I can do the following rejection sampling algorithm. 
um, for a fixed number of steps. I sample a candidate parameter value. I generate data from my model under that parameter value. And if some discrepancy measure between my simulated data and my observed data is close enough, I accept this draw as I draw it. What's the distribution of the accepted draws? Well, it, it's, it's this distribution over here, the, the prior distribution reweighted by an indicator function of the rejection of the acceptance event. Um, hopefully it's renormalized, so it's again a probability, but this is what it's proportional to. And if I'm in the situation where D is actually a metric and epsilon is equal to zero, then this recovers the true posterior distribution. Um, <clears throat> Typically, neither of these things is possible. Um, if my data has a continuous distribution, for instance, then epsilon equals zero will again result in zero acceptances together. Um, so I have to give positive epsilon for reasons of computational feasibility, which means I incur a bias. This is not the true posterior distribution anymore. Also, typically, D will incorporate some sort of summary statistic. So I, I won't look at the sort of full data set that I've generated, which might be a, a big and individuals by segregating sites, binary instance matrix or something like that, because that's too high dimensional and too noisy. Instead, I would compress it to something lower dimensional, typically in genetics, for instance, as high frequency spectrum, for those of you who happen to know what that is. Um, and that's why D might fail to be a metric, is because it's only looking at projections of these, these simulated variables in practice. And so D, DB, D evaluating equals zero does not necessarily guarantee that X is actually equal to Y in most practical cases. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's an algorithm that we can run. It doesn't require anything complicated. If you have a simulator for synthetic data, and that's all you need, which is actually quite easy to implement because a lot of models have these simulators ready off the shelf, and they're typically much, much easier to, to write, to create than and an inference algorithm like into the ones that I've previously been describing. So that's one of the main advantages of, of ABC is just how easy it is to implement in comparison to anything else that I've talked about thus far. Um, but the downside is if this naive rejection algorithm wastes a lot of computation. It doesn't use the sort of accepted sample in any way to inform the region that you ought to sample. Typically your prior will be much more dispersed than your, your posterior if you already have good information about what your parameter ought to be and your sort of prior is narrow and in the right place, then what are you doing running inference in the first instance? <laughs> um, and so very likely you'll end up with rejecting almost everything. And there are ways in which you can come up with more sophisticated algorithms to kind of take advantage of this and learn where you ought to propose while you're going. Probably the simplest way to, to do that is to put um, an ABC type projection step into a Metropolis Hastings algorithm, replacing the accept reject step that I was describing earlier with this kind of simulated, well, is my data close enough or not? And that way I don't have to evaluate any target distributions or anything complicated like that. And so here's a formulation of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm as I gave it at the beginning of the lecture, just with slightly tweaked notation to sort of more nicely gel with the ABC setting. I have an initial state. I sample a perturbation from a proposal distribution Q, which I'm now explicitly assuming to be symmetric, so I don't have to worry about it here. And then I accept or reject this proposal with the correct probability. So this is still standard metropolis hastings. Now let me put the ABC in. So what's happened is when I have my new parameter value, I create synthetic data from the model under that parameter value. And if my discrepancy is low enough, I accept the parameter, else I don't. So I've gotten rid of the metropolis hastings effect project step, replaced it with this simulation-based step. But now, if my proposal kernel Q is again local, then I'm unlikely to propose a big step, and so I'm going to be able to accept more, explore more efficiently, making use of this sort of markup chain structure. There are also more advanced ABC things you can do. It's possible to set up adaptive tuning schemes for this um, for this acceptance parameter epsilon and this proposal distribution Q. Um, it's possible to write down ABC algorithms which have the flavor of important sampling algorithms and those can also be tuned automatically. Um, 
the kind of state of the art in terms of ABC nowadays tends to involve models which are complicated enough that actually just simulating synthetic data is quite an expensive operation. And so the kind of um, where the ongoing research is most active, I think, is in situations where you have an auxiliary model, something like a Gaussian process model or, or, or something along those lines, where you actually fit that model to the realizations of the synthetic data as you go. The thinking being, if I, if I propose a parameter value, which is very similar to parameter values I've already tried before, then I've already simulated synthetic data many times. I probably know roughly what my discrepancy is going to end up looking like without running this simulation. So maybe if I fit just a surface to that, which tells me within some tolerance where what my discrepancy is, then I can use that in order to avoid these simulation steps and reduce the number. I'm, I'm not going to go into any detail about that, but that's the sort of thing that the, the, the people who make their living on state-of-the-art ABC algorithms are thinking about. So, I'm conveniently out of time, and here's just a brief reminder of what's coming up next time. So, recombination and coalescent models, um, it will kill all of the algorithms we've seen thus far, with the partial exception of ABC, and there are still some solu some solutions you can look at for, for fitting models sort of data, whether it's ABC algorithms or using these conditional sampling distributions directly. That's what I'll be talking about on Wednesday. Thank you for your attention and for the video.